everybody. Yes, I'm uh, Teal Phelps Bondroff, our research coordinator, and I want to give you a bit of a deeper dive into the research that we've been working on um, over the course of the year. And I'm going to kind of, Ian started a little bit earlier than I was going to start. And uh, so I'll, I'll organize our research into broader themes. We have a couple of broader themes that we're working on. And the first one is legislative prayer. And as Ian mentioned, we've been working on this since, oh gosh, has it been like almost five years now? It's pretty close to it. Yeah, we're getting we're getting close to five years. And the really cool thing about this is that we've been able to study the change of prayers over time. So a bunch of different things. Ian's already mentioned we had to update our summary paper of prayers across Canada, which is great. I'm hoping we get to update it again. Um, and we've basically started looking at prayer across the country in different municipalities. And so folks will remember that a couple of years ago, we had a report on prayer in British Columbia municipalities. That's not constitutional, according to Saguenay. And that was a really successful report. We found a bunch of municipalities that had uh, broken the constitution by including prayer in their um, inaugural meetings. And we wrote to them and a bunch of them changed their practices. A bunch of them didn't. Um, and I'll get to that in a second. But then we expanded our research using some of our summer researchers to look at prayer um, in municipal councils across the country. And I really can't speak like highly enough of our research team. Municipal websites are pretty bad. Small town municipal websites are really bad. Like we're talking four different fonts on the splash page. And um, they looked at every website of almost every municipality in the country. So we are basically have a database of every municipality that has violated the Saguenay decision and therefore the constitution. And we are writing reports for each province. So we put out a Manitoba report a couple of months ago. And that was sort of our first report. We, um, we got some good, couple of news stories locally in uh, Manitoba. And we're hoping to kick off a debate there. And we're going to do some follow-up work with local activists. And then our step is to write reports for each province and or region moving forward. And the goal is to release those reports working in cooperation with local activists so that we kind of basically like go to a local activist group and say, hey, you know, Secular Society of Saskatchewan, uh, that's a bad acronym, but uh, hey, Secular Society of Saskatchewan, here is um, a report on municipalities in your province that are breaking the constitution and then help them basically do actions around that. So the idea is kind of spreading our wings across the, the Rocky Mountains, but also um, helping support groups around the country that are maybe struggling a little bit. Um, we couldn't find a group in Manitoba because they were all totally overworked and burnt out. And we're hoping that some of this research will help revive movements across the country. So the really cool thing for me is that we're really, like we spread our wings across the, the, the Rockies and are having an influence across the country. So on deck, we have reports for Alberta, Saskatchewan, Ontario, we're probably going to group the Maritimes, although we might do individual reports depending on how things are going. Um, and we'll do a big report on the North. You'll notice Quebec isn't part of that. Um, we had limited uh, capacity to look at the uh, French language websites. We might do more deeper dive into Quebec if one of our summer researchers speaks French. Um, otherwise, we will um, we'll do a, a maybe a summary report for Quebec. And apparently Newfoundland and Labrador is not part of the Maritimes. We may have to do a separate report for them um, with the apologies there. I've, I've worked, I publish articles with a, a Newfoundland and Labradorian and uh, one has to be very careful with these things. So we'll do one report for each of these regions. And then we're also working on a book chapter in an edited volume that we're gonna be writing um, or we're in the process of writing rather and it's Secularism and Non-Religion in Canada. So it's an academic edited volume where we've asked scholars from across the province, country to submit book chapters. And we will also be writing a couple of book chapters ourselves. The idea behind this book was basically, we've published enough to write a book. Why don't we write a book? Um, so we're gonna have a couple of chapters from BCHA research team members. Uh, we've got some uh, content from activists across the country. So the book will be divided into two sections. The second half will be sort of narratives about different activist campaigns. And the first half will be sort of peer reviewed quality academic articles exploring different aspects of secularism and non religion in Canada. And one of those book chapters will be a summary of all the municipalities across the country that are violating Saguenay. And basically, what we're doing here is we're verifying compliance, which people don't really do for Supreme Court rulings. So it's very exciting work. And the it's linked to our advocacy. So while we're not going to take any municipalities to court outside of British Columbia, the municipal elections are coming up in October. And the plan is to watch every municipality in the province to see if they include prayer in their inaugural meetings. They've received two letters from us. They'll receive one more letter from Ian before the inaugural meetings. And if they still have prayer in their inaugural meetings, there will probably be a court case or something, um, basically to reaffirm uh, Saguenay. So we'll be keeping an eye on municipalities in October. And yeah, so that's, that's our work on municipal prayer. 
We've also continued our work on prayer in the BC legislature. As folks will notice, um, we have a book chapter that um, was supposed to come out two years ago, but academic uh, edited volumes take a long time. So it should be coming out very soon, but it's being published by the University of Ottawa. It's the book's called um, Legisl Legislatures in Evolution, Change, Challenges and Questions. And it's by the Canadian Study of Parliament group. And we have our chapter in there. And the chapter is basically taking our House of Prayers study, as people will recall from a few years back, that analyzed all the prayers in the BC legislature. We analyzed them again. And Katie was working um, her absolute magic on the statistics there. And basically the idea was the BC legislature changed its procedures around prayer. And our question was, well, did that change the content and the religiosity of the prayer? And um, I think the plan is to do another similar report in another year or two years so we can have this sort of longitudinal study and look how prayer has changed over time. And we also have amazingly cool data. Like we have it based on gender and age. This is why we had the birthdays of all the MLAs. Um, so folks who are interested in publishing off this data, anyone on the call, please get in touch. We have more data that we can publish off of. And the um, Katie has assured me that the gender and religiosity data is fascinating. Um, and so I'm gonna try and get our summer team to write up that because it's just, it has less of an advocacy role, but it's just really cool findings relating to kind of challenging some of our preconceptions around um, gender and religiosity. So our prayer work. So that's, um, oh, there's more prayer stuff, sorry. Um, so um, we've also had, uh, th that work has been making an impact, right? So Ian already mentioned our report that was our paper that was published in the Canadian Parliamentary Review. And that was read by a lot of parliamentarians such that we actually, yeah, Katie's putting the sneak peeks that the TLDR uh, in, uh, spoilers, I suppose, in the chat there. But um, we, we've actually had a huge influence. So I'm going to see if I can share my screen here and show you folks a TikTok. And hopefully you can hear it okay. And this is basically um, our research being read into Parliament in a debate a couple of weeks ago about whether prayer should be abolished. Let's see if folks can hear this. Les auteurs qui ont euh, étudié les plus de 870 prières prononcées à l'Assemblée législative de la Colombie-Britannique de 2003 à 2019, concluent que les pratiques du Québec à l'égard de ce geste de prière méritaient d'être suivies ailleurs. Et je cite, « Que les prières puissent être remplacées par un moment de réflexion et de silence, comme c'est le cas à l'Assemblée nationale du Québec, la meilleure solution » demeure la simple abolition de la prière à l'Assemblée législative. Hey, on est des modèles. Right. So, um, yeah, that was our House of Prayers report and or the summary of it in the Canadian Parliamentary Review being read into the record in Hansard. The backstory is basically in May 11th, the Bloc Québécois used their, uh, their opposition day to put forward a motion to abolish prayer in the Canadian Federal Parliament and replace it with a moment of reflection. Uh, that was Martin Champoux's motion. And um, the person reading there was Monique Pose. And oh, sorry, you couldn't hear that. Jurgen, I'll put a, I'll put a link to the TikTok here in the chat just so folks can catch up with it afterwards. My apologies. Sometimes the sound doesn't always translate on the old. Um, I'll put it in the chat here for everybody. I got it in there. Oh, thank you. Look at that. Excellent. Um, we're also getting active on TikTok, by the way. That's uh, something that Ian didn't mention. We've got the BZ Humanist account on there. We're reaching new people. Anyhow, so the block had a motion, and unfortunately, it failed 266 to 56, and there were some, you know, typical votes, but there's also some rather telling votes. Um, some members of the NDP and Greens um, block, uh, um, and uh, Conservatives and Liberals voting in interesting ways. And one of the interesting things was um, Mark Gertson's, um, Gerritsen said that no one has brought this issue up before. I've never heard from a constituent on that. Um, first of all, I'm pretty sure he's wrong. But second of all, um, we're going to change that. Um, so we launched a letter writing campaign for across the country so that people could write their MLA, uh, their MPs. And basically, it's building towards a moment in Parliament that's coming up where they will be exploring the pro policies and procedures. So the liberal argument, uh, the liberal arguments that were brought up for what, they, for what they were worth were basically, well, the only compelling argument that I heard was there's other times we should be discussing this, i.e. when we discuss procedure and policy rather than on opposition days. So it looks like that's coming up. And so we are going to be uh, doing a letter writing campaign to put a bit more pressure on MPs to hopefully change their votes. Um, and Ian is currently in the process of drafting a briefing paper that will send all the MPs that will make it sort of a shorter summary. Our, our House of Prayers report is 136 pages long. Uh, so maybe a bit long for... Um, for breakfast reading. Um, and so we'll send that to all the MPs and do a bit of lobbying around that. We also have a second letter writing campaign. Um, and this is the thing I love about the BCHA is we're able to tie our really empirical research with advocacy and activism. 
So the second letter writing campaign has been around prayer in the BC legislature, which continues despite minor changes. And so we drafted a explicitly atheistic prayer and uh, for and, and recognizing the irony of such a statement, uh, but an explicitly atheistic statement that we wrote or we asked people to write to their MLAs and Ian will put a link in the chat here as well uh, to ask them to read that into the legislature. And people were saying, well, you have this overtly atheistic prayer that's offensive to people who are religious. And of course, then they fall accidentally upon the point. The point being that if you're offended by your atheistic prayer, you can understand how people who are not religious are offended by your religious prayers. Maybe we should just abolish them. So um, we've been getting some responses, doing a bit of lobbying as well. Um, and that's tying into our overall work on legislative prayer in BC. And yeah, that interplay between the, the activism and the, the research, I think is really powerful because we're able to say like, to cover lots of bases from academic journals to news stories to, to lobbying and letter writing. Let's move off of um, legislative prayer. And I'm happy to answer any questions folks might have about that. We are, I think we're the experts in this field now. So uh, we've, we've published, certainly published enough on it. So the other area we've been looking at is tax exemptions. Ian already mentioned uh, the clergy residency exemption, but we have a couple of projects coming up where we're looking at permissive tax exemptions for places of worship. And there's three projects and uh, an amazing volunteer uh, researcher, Nikki, is working on this. And uh, we turned it into three things. So there's a book chapter in our forthcoming book exploring permissive and statutory tax exemptions in British Columbia. And then we'll have a report on statutory and a report on permissive tax exemptions. Um, for people who are unfamiliar with those, those are the tax exemptions that a place of worship will receive. The statutory ones they receive automatically by provincial statute. The permissive ones they can receive from their local municipality. Uh, my municipality, for example, this year gave away 1.3 or 1.03 something million dollars of permissive tax exemptions to a host of places of worship. Um, some of them are, you know, running uh, soup kitchens, and then some of them are um, prosperity gospel hate churches that preach uh, conversion therapy and deny the existence of COVID and vaccines. Uh, so it's always a hit and miss. Uh, so our reports are going to have advice for municipalities that they can adopt benefits tests to make sure that recipients of tax exemptions are actually providing a benefit and say aren't breaking the charter or provincial health orders. Um, and then the book chapter will sort of summarize the overall findings, which will be sort of the cost of these tax exemptions. Um, and I was just sharing with you this morning, we got some amazing uh, data. Our researcher kind of went above and beyond and is now breaking it down by type of religion. So we'll be able to stay, say stuff like this religious group received X amount in exemptions, this religious group received Y amount in exemptions. Um, and um, we're going to have to talk to Katie about that because we're going to have to run some fun statistics on it. And I'm still not sure exactly which statistics and I need to defer to your brain. Because uh, I'm, sure. I'm a qualitativist, so... <laughs> So that's our tax exemption work. And I think it's really impactful because a lot of municipalities are always looking to save money and we can convince a few of them to change their policies. There's you know over 160 of them. So we can have a huge impact and it's kind of a shotgun strategy with a lot of potential for municipalities that are tightening the belt. Our April 1st report, Ian's already kind of uh, spoiled, not spoiled, but mentioned that one. So we have two, we have two of those now. Um, and first of all, this year's report, I'm particularly proud of it because we get to use the word zizigy. And we use two words that I, you know, that you don't normally encounter. We have zizigy and discomfiture or decumbiture in the title, which is, I think, pretty high level pretentious and like kind of, you know, on the nose. And also as far as jokes go, and we are getting it like a 30 page report with like over 60 or over 70 footnotes. So it's like, it's a good joke. Um, but what I was going to recommend to people is uh, maybe uh, skim the report, take a look at the beautiful pie graphs. Um, the takeaway from this year's report is there's too much Libra energy in the BC legislature. So if anyone's asking you for some detailed political analysis as to like what's causing issues in British Columbia, it's the Libras. Um, and there's a little bit of Leo energy as well, not enough Aquarius energy in the uh, Liberal caucus. And that's going to really sink them probably in the next election, but it's hard to say. But no, seriously, friends, read the footnotes. We had so much fun making it. Um, there's Monty Python jokes buried in there. And um, it's just a bunch of good fun. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I will say that next year, we're going to switch things up again. Um, I don't want to um, do a spoiler, but we're going to probably move away from astrology. Doesn't seem to be working. We're going to explore some other aspects of woo. Um, so be ready for that. And if anyone's really into numerology, give me a call. We can, we can have some fun. So uh, I want to talk about some of our ongoing projects and uh, kind of where we're going forward. So the first thing is our edited volume. 
So this will probably be something I'll still be talking about at our next AGM because it is an edited academic volume. But the goal is to, to publish an actual book with an actual publisher um, that will be this edited volume. And it's kind of cool. We've got everything from history to sociology to narratives of campaigns to quantitative analysis of seniors' homes um, and aging um, and age and uh, non-belief. So some really cool stuff that's going to be in there. And um, I'm looking forward to having a book that we can you know, add to our, our repertoire of, of publications. And um, yeah, so the, other than that, we have our secular invo invocations guide. So um, a couple of years ago, one of our members or a member reached out to us and said, hey, I have to give a secular invocation and I don't know what, how to do that. And we were like, there must be a guide out there somewhere. There isn't. Um, and so we spent a lot of time trying to abolish prayer in places, but sometimes an invocation is needed or you, you would like to give an invocation rather than fighting. And so we're working on a guidebook um, for that and it's going to have advice on how to give a speech advice on how to put together an invocation and we're compiling a database of quotes that people can include some of the quotes are innocuous and irreligious quotes and then some of them are quotes from prominent atheists and i've spent the last few months diving into um 18th and 19th century um female free thinkers because there aren't enough perspectives it's all white guys otherwise so i spent a lot of fun i had a lot of fun reading some really cool um thinkers in the past 200 years that aren't old white guys uh, no offense to old white guys um but we do need some more diversity in our in our quotes um and so that that book will co probably come out late next year we're still working on on putting it out and it will likely um may also have like a website that goes with the uh, the quotations we're still kind of figuring out the details on that maybe people can let us know at some point we'll ask you what you prefer like a full-on book or like an online database of quotes and things like that so the other thing i'm really excited about and that is our work on reproductive justice so if you folks have been watching what's going on in America, I'm sure you have, it's horrifying. And the BCHA has really stepped up. So um, Ian mentioned that the BCHA has supported the Access BC campaign for free prescription contraception. And full disclosure, I'm the chair of that campaign. Um, and uh, we're getting close to getting that policy out. But the really cool thing about that is the BCHA has been really stepping in, in like the tr true tradition of Morgenthaler uh, to support other reproductive justice issues. So we helped organize a rally for reproductive justice in Vancouver, uh, three weekends ago. Yeah, about two or three weekends ago. And that was in response to Roe v. Wade. And right now we're working on a reproductive justice manifesto with at least four other organizations slash campaigns that we will release if Roe v. Wade falls. Um, so it, we're going to be poised to really do a lot of you know, agitation and activism. But on the research side of things, we've partnered with the Abortion Rights Coalition of Canada, ARC, on uh, two projects at the moment. A couple of years ago, ARC put out a report on crisis pregnancy centers, and those are those air quotes clinics that try to pray or try that prey on people in a vulnerable situation experiencing a crisis, unplanned or crisis pregnancy, and they try to convince them not to have an abortion, sometimes through lying, sometimes through misinformation, sometimes just by tone um, and not referring people to clinics and things like that. So they're, they, they prey on people in vulnerable situations and couple years back, the Abortion Rights Coalition of Canada did a study of their websites and looked at all the different ways they try to manipulate people. And we are working with them to update that report to be, so we can study how their websites have changed over the years. And it's quite eye-opening. Like they've done all sorts of different tricks. They've gotten better in some ways. Some of them have gotten worse. They have disclaimers now that say they don't refer to clinics and things like that. So we've been working with them on that. It's this amazing team of like really awesome feminists and the project should be coming up pre sometime this summer. The addendum to that, and this is a, the BCHA led project, is we did a deep dive into the crisis pregnancy centers in British Columbia. There's, I believe, 23. We may have found a 24th that was on the cusp. And they're across the province. There's more of them than there are, say, abortion clinics, and um, or it's pretty close. Basically, what we're doing is we're putting together a report that will do an analysis of each individual crisis pregnancy center, but we're looking at things that the other report's not looking at. So we're looking at their zoning, their tax exemptions, um, whether they receive government subsidies, where they're located, their signs. Um, there's all sorts of dirty tricks that crisis pregnancy centers pull. They'll have a similar logo to the local women's shelter or clinic. They will have people, they'll have a nurse with an ultrasound machine. They'll pretend they're real doctors. They'll pretend they're real counselors and all sorts of other machinations. So we're doing a profile of each one. And the idea is and then we can equip activists with tools to make sure that these organizations aren't taking advantage of people, whether that's taking tax money, whether that's lying on their websites, things like that. 
So that'll be sort of a profile of each one. And then the third project is kind of on the horizon that we're struggling to figure out how to actually study our maternity homes. Um, these are what would archaically be, be referred to as homes for unwed mothers, um, where young women in trouble, again, air quotes for people who are listening at home, uh, people in trouble would go and who were experiencing unplanned pregnancy, go and give birth, and then the child would be given up for adoption. These still exist in Canada. Some of them are funded, receive funding from governments, and we hear bad things about them. Uh, where people are manipulated or coerced into having um, giving up their child for adoption and all sorts of other kind of darker stories. We're struggling to find a way of actually identifying them because a lot of them are like in private homes or in out in the bush. So we're, we'll st we're still trying to look at that, but we're interested in looking at it because it's something that was brought to our attention and it's, it's a dark hidden part of uh, reproductive justice issues in, in Canada. And a couple last things, uh, ongoing projects, I'll wrap up here because I know it's, it's been a long meeting and we've done a great job staying on time here. We're doing a lot more research into school funding and school policies. So our summer researchers are going to be run ragged. Ian and I met this morning and we're running through our, our summer research program. Uh, the first year we had our summer researchers, we like ran out of, they, they went through all the work too quickly. So now we just laden them with work and we never get caught up. But we're still publishing up the data from our summer researchers like three years ago now. So we, we get it done. But um, looking at schools and school policies that may give special treatment or don't give special treatment to religious um, beliefs, creationism, that kind of thing. Um, we are gonna be looking at hospitals and their policies relating to medical assistance and dying abortions as well. That's one of our stretch goals. Another stretch goal is looking at um, universities and religious elements of convocations and various ceremonies in that respect. And we're also going to be looking at the history of prayer in the federal parliament and in the BC legislature. Those projects kind of depended upon our getting access to the libraries, but um, the idea is to understand the debates around prayer in the legislature, um, just given that it's happening in parliament right now, and we'd like to contextualize our research in um, a longer sort of historical setting. We're also going to work on a couple of bios of prominent British Columbian atheists, secularists, and uh, free thinkers, and a bunch of other things. <laughs> and, and working on all the other projects I mentioned that are still ongoing, like the legislative prayer, municipal prayer work, the tax policy, and things along those lines. So that's a lot. We've got a lot of things going on. And I think, you know, Ian was mentioning this earlier that over the last few years, we've been churning out a lot of research. So expect more. And when you get an email from Ian that's like, hey, participate in this letter writing campaign, please do, because it's linked to a lot of this research. And we kind of like coming at issues from multiple angles. It makes us more effective. And uh, share that with your friends as well and help us get the word out there about our research and our advocacy. Oh, and finally, I, it is worth noting, I, I was really grateful for Adriana and her amazing work on the on the research team. She, like, I, I kid you not, has the most patience for having gone through every municipal website in the bloody country. And I, I could tolerate maybe five of them. They're really bad. So uh, amazing work. And we still have so much data that we can use from our amazing researchers over the past few years as well. Um, so with, with that, I will I'll open up questions. I, I'm sure I've forgotten a few of our projects and things along the ways, um, but we are keeping very busy and doing what I think is really important work and having a good influence. Oh, uh, sorry, I forgot one last thing, which is Ian mentioned that our work was quoted in the federal parliament, but it was also quoted in the Manx legislator, the House of Keys, uh, the parliament for the House of Man. Uh, did, was doing a debate on whether they should reform their prayer policy. Unfortunately, that motion didn't pass, but they surveyed prayer in England, Scotland, Northern Ireland, Ireland, and British Columbia, and uh, which I think was just great to be part, included in an otherwise large group of large political entities, um, and our report was read into the record there. So we've been hansardized in two different uh, parliaments, three, I suppose, if you include BC, which I don't know if we've been directly hansardized, uh, which is not bad for a small research team out here on, in British Columbia.